Now we have a very short time. And we're going to talk on maturing spiritual children. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Here is the calling of the minister. As a pastor, as a teacher, as an evangelist. And I want you to see the work this way. You are bringing this person, a complete sinner. You are preaching to him, and then he comes to Christ. He is born again, saved. A child of God, but only a babe. Then you lead him through, he becomes baptized in water. Not only that, he becomes a disciple. A disciple is a learner. And he begins to learn. He is now moved from being a sinner to a babe in Christ. To a disciple that is learning. And then you are teaching him. To observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. You are maturing him. He is becoming not just a babe now. He is becoming a real child. And is getting to adulthood. Before you know what is happening, he is becoming a soul winner. First, a babe. You have developed him. is now a disciple learning. Now he's sharing his testimony and sharing the word of God. is becoming a soul winner. Ultimately, as you have taught him whatsoever Christ has commanded, he is becoming a worker in the church. How can somebody know everything that Christ has commanded and not be a worker in the church? He is becoming a worker. In fact, eventually he moves from being a worker to becoming a minister of the gospel. That's our responsibility. We are not to leave the believers just in the baby stage. We are to mature them. We are to develop them. We are to teach them. We are to train them until they come to maturity. The Bible in the New Testament points to different stages of maturity. Levels of Christian experience. First John chapter 2 from verse 12. I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Verse 13. I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Have you noticed verse 12? Little children. Have you noticed verse 13? Young men. Have you noticed in verse 14? I've written to you, unto you, fathers. So then, we have little children. We have young men. We have fathers. And somebody must be working with them. Teaching them. Instructing them. Developing them before they can move from the baby stage to the children, to the young men, and to the fathers. And it is our responsibility as pastors in the church that we will mature the believers. I've said from Matthew chapter 28 
that were preached the gospel. These people are turned away from sin. They turned to the Savior. Having turned to the Savior, we have brought them through. And they are now baptized in water. We are discipling them. Just like in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. We are told, They that gladly received this word, they were baptized. And that day, there were added unto the church about 3,000 souls. After that, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, in fellowship, in prayers. They were being matured. Then we are told all these people eventually went out and they preached the gospel everywhere they went. They evangelized. They were soul winners. And eventually, out of them, there could be chosen people that were matured enough to handle the work in the church. Now let's come back to this passage. Children. What do we know of children? Children are in various categories in the New Testament. There are children, babes in Christ, that are rejoicing in their new found faith. And as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. There are these desirous babes that are always coming. They want everything that the pastor will offer. They want to study the Bible. They want to be in the prayer meeting. They want to be in the church. They want to see if they can get involved in any area of the work. Yet they are babes. But they are rejoicing in their new found faith. But there are some babes in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul complained about because they stayed in the baby stage for too long a time. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. Now, what was the problem? Was it that there were no qualified teachers and workers in the church? Or oh, the Corinthian church was so lucky, so fortunate. They had the best of ministers. The apostle Paul was mightily used of God to bring them to the Lord. Not only that, they had the privilege of having that eloquent preacher, Apollos. And that man could talk convincingly. He was a mighty teacher in the Corinthian church. Not only that, they had had the privilege that Peter had been a visiting apostle. And when he spoke, he spoke from the past when we were with Christ. Spoke of the present as we enjoy the power of the Holy Spirit. Speaks in the future as we apostles of Christ will be at the new Jerusalem as the Lord Jesus Christ promised us. In fact, they had so many ministers and teachers that they were beginning to pick and choose, saying, I am of Paul. That man, I like him because he talks and he will was, he was talk about his, the Greek background, sometimes speak in Hebrew, sometimes speak in Aramaic. I love the way that Paul will talk. Other people will say, there's nobody to compare with Apollos. It's mighty and eloquent. The way he illustrates and demonstrates the truth, Apollos is my man. Other people will say, you know, I like somebody that can refer to the time he sat with Jesus Christ. And that story of the Mount of Transfiguration, I will never forget. In fact, the eyes of Peter the sparkle when he talks about the story of the transfiguration. That's my minister. There are so many people teaching them that they began to pick and choose. We may have qualified teachers and yet our church may not grow spiritually. We may have people that can teach and talk and lay line upon line. And be very effective speakers. And yet the babes may not grow up. And so we must have it as our aim, as our goal. That the babes in our churches will grow. 
Now, these babes, Paul the Apostle said, they were carnal. He said in verse 2, I have fed you with milk, not with meat. What do we learn of babes? The thing about babes is that they might be excited, they might be tickled, they might be interested in this speaker, this speaker, this speaker, but they will still be carnal. Not that they are going to commit sin like those sinners outside, but they are carnal because they are not able to bear meat. For either to ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For are ye not carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Little children, they think like men. That is, like the men of the world. They talk like the men of the world. They're still babes. They're not matured. They walk by sight, not by faith. They walk according to the systems of men. But then, there are some other types of babes. Hebrews chapter 5. And from verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. If you have little children at home, you know this about children. Your child will ask you a question and you give an answer. You give an explanation. If your explanation is all theoretical, abstract, logical, as if you were talking to an adult, that child will smile. He's interested in what you are saying. The second day, that child is coming back to ask you the same thing again. Why? Because he's a child. And when you spoke to him, you didn't talk as if you were talking to a child. You spoke as if you were talking to a university lecturer. You were too logical. Too ide- you had too much of ideology. And you were heavy. You were abstract. There was no story in what you said. There was no illustration in what you said. Therefore, the child is not going to get it. But bring in a little story to illustrate the truth. Speak in a very simple way. Don't talk in a way as to drive that individual. Talk simple. With illustration. With a good story. And repeat it over and over. And let the child repeat that. Know that we are dealing with a child. Because the child cannot manage something that is too deep. Let me tell you something that may surprise you. People who go to seminary. Now seminary is good. Bible college is good. But wait. People who go to seminary. And who study very well. The higher you go in theology. The less your church becomes in number. I am sorry, but it's so. Take a man that can preach simple message with stories, with illustration, with simple Bible passage. And his church will grow. You know why? People are babies. They like stories. They like illustration. They will come. Who they say, I like that pastor. He reaches me at the place where I am. The stories he tells, they are about the problems I have in the house. But that pastor, that will get people like that together, children, and they love what he says. He goes to America or Britain, and he has the first degree in theology. 
and divinity. <laughs> then he writes home and he says, I will soon come back. I will soon come back. I'm taking a course on Greek. I'm taking a course on psychology. And he has master's degree on theology. And he says, I'm coming back, but I'm not reading for my DD, doctorate in divinity. And he gets it. And he comes back. The first Sunday he spends in church, nobody is going to understand him. <laughs> And if he's not careful, he's going to drive everybody away. He doesn't understand that theology doesn't reach the baby. He doesn't understand that his Greek and psychology does not reach the baby. The babies want illustration. They want it simple. They want it to reach them at the level where they are. And the pastor the teacher, the preacher that forgets on how to take people away from the baby stage talk to them at their level and then bring them up he will never mature the church he will never mature all those children he is coming as if all those children are already university postgraduate students and he is going to be talking above their heads But Paul the Apostle said, For the time ye ought to be teachers, you are still babes. And if they are still babes, then take them from that level. Who are babes? Babes are those people that cannot manage things that are too deep. Then the young men. The young men are the people that are getting developed in wisdom. They are getting developed in handling life's situation. In fact, John tells us in a passage I've read to you already in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 13. He says, young men, you have overcome the wicked one. He also says concerning the young men that you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome. And so let's understand, we're bringing the children away from the level of children, and then we're bringing them higher. Talk at their level. Preach at their level. Bring them to the stage of young men. Don't be in a hurry. Maturity takes time. Then the fathers... These are the people that are settled and stable. Why are they called fathers? What's the difference between a father and a child? One difference. The father is able to raise up other children. The child is not able to raise up other children. The father is able to reproduce. By the time that they come to that reproduction level, that now they are able to reproduce, They're able to teach. And not only that, a father can come out of his own parents' house because he has now become a father. He has married. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his own wife so that they can raise their own children. That means you don't have to stay with him now every day, every week. He can be given some independence because he is matured. Because he can handle matters alone by himself with some maturity and some level of understanding as a father. And he is an overcomer. He is not the one that is uh, running back home every time saying, I've got into trouble again. Now our work is that we must mature spiritual children. But what will that take? It will take a lot, really. But let's just see briefly. 2 Peter chapter 1, from verse 5. 
And beside this, giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Now, what does it mean? And beside this, giving all diligence. If we're going to mature spiritual children, we'll need to spend time. Have you seen how our wives have done it? When the child is born. Especially if those, uh, if two children come at the same time, twins. Two days or two weeks after your wife has delivered baby twins, can she say, you know, I've been thinking of traveling to London for a long, long time. And I think now that these twins have arrived and I'm free, I think, uh, husband, take care of them because summer will be over soon. And I don't want to miss this summer. I must be in London. I won't spend more than three months. So take care of them. Bye. How reasonable will that be? How reasonable is it for me when I've just finished the crusade? And all those converts are there. Not just twins. Not just triplets. 300. And I travel to London. Leaving all those spiritual babies. Nobody to take care of them. Just like if my wife will just deliver twins and then go to London on holiday. We shouldn't be doing that. We should take care of those children. It takes time. It takes planning. And it says giving all diligence. Then it says these are the things that are needed. You know, many times we think that if we are going to develop children to become young men to become fathers we say they must learn memorize bible passages that's good it's good to memorize bible passages but you can quote the whole bible and not be matured you can cram the bible memorize bible and not be matured it takes time to add to your faith virtue Good behavior. To add to your virtue, knowledge. To add to your knowledge, self-control. And we need to know how to train the people. how How to train the spiritual babes. Not just the knowledge. It's easy to just, you know, give out knowledge, give out knowledge. Knowledge about man, about sin, about Christ, about God. About things to come, about the rapture about the Holy Spirit. No, that's just knowledge. But adding virtue to faith, knowledge to virtue, self-control to knowledge, patience to self-control, and godliness to patience, brotherly kindness to godliness, and charity, perfect love to kindness. It will take time. And this is the area of personal spiritual growth. This is the quality of life that we live. And if these members in our churches are not growing in their qualities of life, then we are not maturing them. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18, But grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in grace, grow in grace. Grace. Now, let's do this. You know what we did in the afternoon with victory? Do you remember that? We'll do the same thing with grace. You'll write grace from the top to the bottom.
Don't economize paper. Write it where there is space. Because I'm going to tell you some other things to write. Grace, write it just downwards. G R A C E. Have you done that? You've done that? Okay. For G, write God. For R, write riches. R I C H E S. Riches. A, put T in front of A to make art. For C, Christ. Then for E, expense. E X P E N S E. Expense, expense. Then when as you are reaching God, put an S in front of God with an apostrophe. Apostrophe is a comma uh, on top of that S. Before the S. Between D and S, put a comma on top. It's called an apostrophe. Is that alright? For Christ, also put an S in front of Christ and put an apostrophe, a comma between that T and and S. No so didn't come with notebook. You say, why did I come to this place without a notebook? I didn't know that we we're going to, going back to seminary again. <laughs> now you won't get a DD before you go, but you'll get enough to be able to make the church grow. Is that all right? Now, what's grace? That's what we have written down. God's riches at Christ's expense. And those riches are unsearchable. There are very many. The riches of God. God's riches at Christ's expense. So, when the Bible says that we should grow in grace... I begin to pick up the riches, God's riches, one by one, at Christ's expense. All that he purchased at Calvary. All that he made available at Calvary. And I begin to grow in them. I begin to grow in them. And then I help and teach the church to grow in grace. To grow in God's riches which have been made available at Christ's expense. And that means that it will take time. It's um, I've said that when we're growing like that, we have wisdom to handle life's situations. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's just telling us that there is the possibility of growth. The greatest teacher that ever lived is our own Savior, Jesus Christ. And is the one that brought his own disciples to maturity. Now, let's think of this. Let's look at Peter, James, John, Matthew. The twelve disciples. They were called one by one. Let's understand, before they were called... They knew nothing of grace. They knew a little about the law. They knew nothing of God as Father. 
they knew much about God as creator. They didn't know much about the power of the Holy Spirit in dwelling in the believer, enlightening the believer. They knew a little about the Holy Spirit coming upon a judge in the Old Testament to fight a battle or coming upon a prophet to see visions in the Old Testament. They didn't know too much about bringing people, Jews and Gentiles, into the kingdom. In short, they were brought into Christ and into the church raw, ignorant, foolish. They didn't know much. And within three years, Christ had taught them. Christ had developed them. And then he said, the whole crown of what you have received will come in a few days' time. You have not known everything, but you are going to have an experience in a few days' time that will make a great change in your ministry and in your life. And ten days after he left, the Holy Spirit came. Then begin to see that those apostles, Peter preached, a single sermon, and 3,000 were converted. Well, I don't think uh, that was bad, because he has not spent four years in Christian understanding. He was not a 20-year-old convert. He was not a 10-year-old convert. He had come into Christ less than four years, and in less than four years, a single message had... 3,000 converts. I think that's great. Christ must have matured them in a proper way. And then, just in a few days after, Peter and John went to a place, and then as they were going, said, Silver and gold have I none. What I have, I give unto you. Rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked. I think that's something that a person would have spent only less than four years and that will happen. And then all the people came together. Well, the converts I know, the Christians I know, if they have only been just four years in the church and they healed the sick like that and thousands of people come together and they say, ah, look at what they have done. The Christians I know, they would say, yes, how great I am. Those are the Christians I know. But the one that Jesus developed, he said, why are you looking on us? I say by our power, holiness, we have done this. Then he began to preach Jesus Christ and 5,000 got converted. Those people were well trained. How did Jesus do it? That he trained them like that. That in less than four years, they could be entrusted with the work of turning not only Jerusalem, but the world over. And it could leave the work totally in their hands. Now let me ask you. We have spent maybe more than four years in our churches. Can God take you away like he took Elijah away and say, well, that's enough. Since we spent four years with them, let the work remain with them now. They can carry on everything. I, you say, no, Lord. You'll talk like Hezekiah, Lord. I'm not ready to die yet. And God was, how many years do you need more? At least 15 years. <laughs> but in less than four years, look at what happened. How did Jesus do it? Let me give you the points. Very briefly, then you are pastors and preachers yourself. You'll study it yourself. But I'll just give you the points. Number one, conversion. Let us make sure that the point at which we start with these people, the people that are coming into the church, is at the level of conversion. Jesus called the disciples one by one. And he made sure that the very first thing they experienced when he called them is conversion. They were converted. Peter said, depart from me, O Lord, 
Because I'm a sinner He said follow me From now you will catch men They were converted Matthew became converted Philip became converted Nathaniel became converted Their lives changed That's the point at which we start And let us make sure that The people that are coming into the church They are brought to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ Number two Association Number one is conversion Number two is association Now before we come back to the Lord Jesus Christ Our school system Our children are sent to school. How do the teachers teach and train them? Is it only by giving them lectures and lessons? No. They associate with those children and associate those children with one another. Why? Because the teachers know that there are some lessons of life you will never understand. If there is no association between the teacher and the student, between the student and the student, therefore, those teachers will sit down at the kindergarten with those little children playing with the plaster, playing with the mud, drawing some funny pictures, cutting the orange, tearing the paper, Associating with them And then after they have associated with the children They will tell the children to associate with one another Play with one another Take the things that the teachers have taught Juggle them Push them around And handle them With one another If you have children Do you realize that your first child took a long time learning language but your second child took a shorter time learning the language have you noticed that that's because of association that when the first child was born suddenly the first child and mommy daddy did not like the cry of children daddy was not experienced And it's only mommy talking to the child. And it took that child a long time. And then, by the time the second child is born, daddy is becoming used to the cry of children. Mommy is still, of course, even more experienced now. And the first child too is associating with that second child. Because of that, daddy is available Mommy is available The first child is available And there is much association The child, the second child is going to learn faster You know Jesus did it By association In the sheep He was with them That's association On the mountainside He was with them That's association When there was a gathering together Of 5,000 people And there was no food to give to them. Jesus was there with them. When the demon was to be cast out, they were there with them. He was there with them. Because of that association, first of all, conversion. Number two, association, there was learning. Faster learning. And so, members in our church will learn more if we are associating with them. If we are available to them. Not just the things that we teach. But the very fact that we are available. And we are there to be seen. We share our lives with them. They learn from us. They observe how we do it. That is a great thing. Number three. Intercession. Jesus prayed a lot. Half of the time he never prayed for himself. You can depend on that. Paul 
prayed a lot. Half of the time, he never prayed for himself. It was all a ministry of intercession. You see, these members of the church, through your ministry, they have experienced conversion. And then you love them so much because you are involved in their growth and in their maturity that you are available all the time. You are associating with them. When they make their mistakes, you are there to correct. When they are doing something good, you are there to commend them. And when they are persecuted, you are there to comfort them. And when it appears they are going through the fire and going through the storm, you are there to share with them. There is association. And because the sheep sees the shepherd very near, there is no panicking, there is no fear. Because the child sees the mother or the parents, the father and the Lord very near, therefore there is no panicking. And also they are encouraged to be in fellowship with one another as members of the same church that that association is encouraged to continue therefore they are growing then when they face persecution the pastor is praying for them intercession when they face difficulties the pastor knows about it and the pastor has a prayer book in that prayer book he enters the names of those members of the church one by one. So and so is facing persecution. And it's down in his prayer book. So and so has been praying for marriage for a long time. And he has not had a person to marry. That person enters into the pastor's prayer book. So and so has been facing difficulty in his business and is bringing a serious concern to him that enters into the pastor's prayer book. And one by one, one by one. And then when he's going to pray, in his own private prayer, he has that notebook in hand. And then when he wants to pray, he opens his eyes. And to avoid sleeping, he walks about in his room while he's praying. He opens his eyes, he says, oh, that is James. And he begins to pray, oh Lord, James is boisterous, James is aggressive, softening him. He's a son of thunder. But if he continues like that, Samaritans will never get converted. Therefore, Lord, soften him. Then, he's closing. then he opens his eyes. He says, oh Lord, I remember John now. John is young, but John is uh, too vocal. And John is too aggressive. And he is a good uh, person, but only that he wants to call fire down. Oh Lord, I pray that he will understand that he must not call fire down, but he must have mercy on people. Oh Lord, change, uh, change John. Then he opens his eyes. Oh Lord, you have given me Peter as an apostle. You have given Peter as a real, uh, as a real stone. But even though he's a stone, he's not like a rock. He's shifting here and there. Always making promises he will never fulfill. Therefore, Lord, this disciple Peter that you have given me, I want you to just confirm him in the faith. Change him. I can see that in the future he can do a lot, but he's still a raw material right now. Oh Lord, this is my disciple uh, Matthew. He never talks. I don't know what is in his mind. He will never say anything. I don't know whether he's regretting that he, he left uh, all the, all the accounts behind. And when I look at his face, he's always calculating. Oh Lord, make him, make him committed. Make him consecrated. And then you open your eyes again and then, and you see Thomas and you say, Oh Lord, uh, Thomas, I talk to him every time, but he doesn't seem to believe everything I say. Make him a believer. That he will not be doubting again. One by one, as a pastor, minister of intercession, you go over them one by one. One by one. That's how you mature them. Conversion. Association. Intercession. Number four. Demonstration. Demonstration. Jesus Christ will take those disciples 
And if he wants to cast out devils, he'll get all those disciples around. He'll demonstrate the power of God for them to see. Because you will know how to do those things by seeing it done. Do you know that our wives, when we have daughter, how do they train these daughters? They say, you are a daughter, come. Look at me. You will marry eventually. This is how we sweep the ground. And the mother is demonstrating it. And then we'll buy toy and say, bring your bag. Put that toy at the back and put a uh, put wrapper. Say, that's how you carry a child. Go and bring that bottle of oil. Stay here. This is how we fry plantain. Demonstration. And eventually, you will discover that because of that demonstration, that lady, when that daughter grows up to be a lady, she will know how to cook more than the fellow that never tried anything, no demonstration, and just went to home economics and came out and burnt all the plantain. <laughs> but demonstration. And Jesus demonstrated it. In raising the dead, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. We're going to train these members of the church. We demonstrate before them. Demonstrate love. Demonstrate humility. Demonstrate prayer. Demonstrate leading choruses. Demonstrate having night vigil. Demonstrate having um, an open air crusade, open air meeting. Demonstrate church planting. Demonstrate personal evangelism. And that's where those Jehovah's Witnesses are more effective than those of us that have the truth about Jesus Christ. They pick up somebody who has come into their fold and they say, just follow us. And while that person follows them, they demonstrate how to argue. They demonstrate how to confuse the innocent. And if that person sees enough demonstration of confusion, he too can come out and confuse another fellow. Demonstration. And that's how, that's how Jesus trained his disciples. Number one, conversion. Number two, association. Number three, intercession. Number four, what's that? Demonstration. Number five is selection. Selection. To select. Select. He had many disciples. And he began to select them one by one after prayer. And he selected the twelve. While he sent them out to go and preach, he was already thinking of selecting other people, the seventy. Selection. And in the church, we will need, after the people have been converted, we are associating with them. You see, when you associate with them, with people, members of your church, you know their strong points, you know their weaknesses, you know where they are wise, you know where they are foolish, you know what they have learned, you know what they have not learned, and then where they are making their mistakes, you are interceding for them and praying for them. Where you know they don't know enough, you are demonstrating to them so that they will learn from your demonstration. And then the people that are catching what you are teaching, the instruction and the training, you are making selection. And in your selection, you are selecting the right people for the right job at the right time. Selecting the right people for the right job and the right time. 
Now, you're not just going to say, I picked this fellow. Maybe he's the wrong person for the wrong job at the wrong time. But because you're associating with them, you know their strong points. You know what they know. You know what they don't know. Therefore, your selection is guided by your observation, by your experience and interaction with them, and by the Spirit of God because you are praying for them. Selection. Number six. Impartation. When you impart something, impart, impartation. I M P A R T A T I O N. Impartation. You know what Jesus did after he selected the disciples, the apostles. And he was going to make them do something. Before he sent them to go and do that thing, he imparted unto them. He gave them power to heal the sick and to cast out devils. That's impartation. He imparted the thing they needed, the power they needed, the authority that they needed. He imparted unto them. Oh yes, he had prayed for them. That's intercession. But now directly, he imparted to them. And you know that's why Paul the Apostle was saying that I planned to come to Rome that I may impart unto you some spiritual gifts. Impartation. And that's why when the seven were chosen, when they began to murmur and to grumble in the early church, because some of the widows were being neglected, the apostle said, it is not right for us to lead the ministry of the world and to concentrate on material things, on distributing bread, on tables. Therefore, choose out men. That's selection. Choose out men, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint on this work. When they have chosen them, they laid hands on them, impartation, giving them the courage for the work, power for the work, authority for the work, the resources they needed for the work, impartation, and We should be willing to do that for the people that are going through this process. Number seven, consecration. Consecration. Jesus led his disciples in a confession of their consecration. Peter said, Lord, see, we have left all things and we have followed you. What shall we gain or get? Therefore, that's the confession of their consecration, leaving all things and following him. And Jesus motivated, motivated his disciples that they will be consecrated every time. He will say, you are the ones that have followed me in the time of my temptation, in the time of my trial. And you will reign with me when the time comes. And sometimes they will say that those who love their lives will lose it. But those who give up, give over, lose their lives, for my sake, they'll find it. He was leading them so that they'll be consecrated. Consecration. He motivated them. And he will tell them about parables of the talent. That he gave, the master gave some one, five, one, two, another one he gave one. Leading them that they will see that if they had consecration and commitment and they made use of their talents very well, there is a reward at the end of the whole thing. And so, as we're developing all these disciples, believers, maturing them, let's lead them so that everything we say 
the parables we give, the illustrations we give, the examples that we show them, and the instructions we show them will make them committed and consecrated unto the Lord. Consecration. Number eight, delegation. Delegation. Now, when you delegate, that means you have looked at the field. You already you have made selection. And you have imparted spiritual gifts. And you have made them to commit and consecrate themselves for the work. You are now saying, go to that field. You are delegated to that area of work. Then you too go to that field. You are delegated to that area of work. There's delegated authority, delegated power to officiate or to preach or to minister in an area where they are to manifest all that they have been taught. You delegate. Do we understand that word? Yes. Delegation. And they were sent out two by two. And then the 72, the 70 were sent out two by two. Number nine, supervision. Supervision, you supervise supervision. You know, many times we say, these people, I delegated the work to them, but they have ruined it. And therefore, I will never try it again. I'll never allow anybody to do anything again because the ones I delegated to them, they ruined the whole work. You know, Jesus did it. He sent them out to the places where he himself will come. He was going to supervise. Not that he has sent them and then he was resting and sleeping. Not involved again. Detached. You must be involved. You have made somebody to be the superintendent of Sunday school. Supervise. You have said somebody must be in charge of the children on the school. Supervise. You have brought in somebody to be in charge of the choir in the church. Supervise. And you have brought somebody to be in charge of the women work in the church. Supervise. You have sent out evangelism team to preach in open air. Supervise. You, are, you have youth wing in the church and the youth are encouraging one another supervise there must be supervision and Jesus supervised the work that they did so we mustn't pull back, we mustn't be detached, we must keep on the job, that even though they are doing it even though they are preaching the gospel you know some ministers when you are training your young ministers and they are preaching in the church service some of our ministers, because they are senior pastor, they will not have Bible in their hand. They are senior pastor. And they have given out the preaching for the day, for the morning. And then, even while the young pastor that is still under training, while he's preaching, they might uh, just fold their arms, they will not uh, read anything. And if um, the young pastor made a mistake and uh, this young pastor said in um, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 38 <laughs> verse 5 and then the Young pastor preaching that looks for Second Chronicles chapter thirty-eight verse five, and opened and opened and opened. I didn't see chapter thirty-eight. Well, so anyway, what it says is that we should be serious and zealous for the Lord. <laughs> and Second Chronicles only reaches chapter thirty-six, but the senior pastor will not know, and he will not correct that individual. And when such mistakes are made over and over and over again, and there is no supervision, 
and the people are just doing what they like, the church will not grow. And the people will not be brought to maturity. Let's do some revision. Number one, what is it? Number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, seven, eight, and nine, we have almost finished. Number ten is reproduction. Reproduction. You know what Jesus said in John chapter 15? Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name He'll give it to you. He wants us to reproduce. He wants us to bear fruit. And the same thing, we want the people that we have brought up, that we have delegated some work into their hands, we're supervising, we want them to reproduce. And so all our correction, when we're supervising them, should be aimed at making them productive. All our encouragement should be that they bear fruit. Now, when we commit things into hands of some workers in the church, and this person comes, let's say he preaches forcefully and effectively. But even though he's forceful, you see that the result of that forcefulness does not bear fruit. Is not well trained. This person might come and then you tell him to do this thing. The way he does it, he quotes Bible. And he goes from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers to Jeremiah to Joshua to Judges and to First Samuel to Ruth to Esther to Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Isaiah and Malachi and Revelation and Matthew and everything. My this person, he knows Bible. He has preached for only one hour and he quotes about 50 passages. <laughs> what do you do? Do you say, well, this man in our church knows so much Bible, I can leave the church in his hand now. No. If you are frying plantain, moderate the fire to the size of the plantain. If the fire is much more than the plantain, everything will burn. And if that person is teaching the church, let him moderate the references to the level of the congregation. Correct him. If he quotes too many passages... He will not bear fruit. If he talks too much, he will not reproduce. He's not just quoting Bible. You supervise him and correct him. And you tell him that fire is too much for that plantain. You will burn that thing. Lower that fire. Those references are too many for that small congregation. You'll burn them up. Put some water inside. Go slow. We're not going to teach them everything in one sermon. They're still coming next Sunday. Let's be careful. You supervise them, you correct them so that they can reproduce. I believe that if we begin to practice all these things, will bring the church to maturity. Let's rise up and pray. Let's thank the Lord for what he's teaching us in this conference.